that this is a status update, not a request to advance uh, through the staging process, and that uh, the presentation will explain why we're not asking for advancement, but uh, in the absence of advancement, it's, it's easy to think that nothing's happening. And in fact, um, a significant number of uh, people and groups on the committee uh, have been working together on this and a lot has been happening. So this is bringing you up to date uh, on what's been happening and how we're thinking about the boundaries between the proposals have changed. The preceding presentation was by uh, Kumavis of MetaMask. Uh, I thought that was a really great presentation, by the way, uh, where uh, he was talking about uh, the things that MetaMask is doing to incorporate SES uh, to make MetaMask itself safer and the extent to which their problems are not in any way MetaMask specific, but are, are general across the ecosystem. And this was, this is a graph uh, from Kumavis of the package dependency graph that make up MetaMask. And what we see here is representative of a tremendous number of applications out uh, in the world. Uh, NPM, uh, NPM estimates that of the typical JavaScript application, about 3% of the code is specific to the application, is written by the group creating the application, and the remaining 97% of the code are libraries written by third parties that are linked in. And under JavaScript as it is today, any one of those libraries can completely corrupt the application. In the context of MetaMask, since MetaMask is the primary user interface framework for creating user interfaces to decentralized applications, to applications running on blockchain, any one of the packages linked in could not only corrupt the user interface, but all of the assets that that person is using through the user interface, the malicious library can steal all of those assets. So the exposure here, the risk exposure is really uh, quite frightening. So what uh, Sessify is doing, their Browserify plugin, is that it's doing a, first of all, it's doing a tofu analysis. Uh, that's a tofu that Kumavis wrote based on the tofu that Bradley wrote. Uh, he's taking a look at what each module apparently depends on by this uh, naive static analysis, uh, creating a configuration file uh, that records those apparent dependencies. And then in spawning these things under SES, we're spawning them such that the authority we're giving them, the initial authority we're giving them, is only the authority that we think they need based on this naive static analysis. So if they're, if they're trying to, in some sneaky way, gain authority that they weren't naively obtaining, authority that wasn't revealed through the uh, naive static analysis, anything sneaky they're doing to obtain more initial authority should be blocked by SES. So the coloring here is uh, the degree of danger that these different modules represent based on what things they're dependent on. Uh, something that's shown as green is basically not dependent on anything that we've flagged as unsafe, uh, like access to the network or direct access to a DOM node. Uh, uh, this red thing over here, we mouse over it and we see what it apparently depends on both its globals and its um, the modules that it imports. And we see that one of the globals that it depends on is XML HTTP request. So in order to run that module, you have to run it in an environment in which 
there is a global named XML HTTP request and in which that global acts enough like the XML HTTP request that it's expecting uh, as to enable that module to run. So any security review of these things would start with the red nodes and proceed down in colors towards the green. And for these dangerous imports, you can also take a look at what the module actually does with them and figure out whether you want to manually impose interpose an attenuator. Uh, if this thing is only doing a few things with XML HTTP request, if it seems, for example, to only be accessing pages at a given host, uh, you could attenuate it uh, so that it only can access pages at that host, uh, things like that. Um, the, the main thing is that uh, SES gives us this ability to constrain these modules initially to the uh, naively um, scraped authority uh, and then uh, under further maintenance according to some policy that somebody expresses uh, by manipulating this, this graph. So for those who haven't already, uh, aren't, are not already familiar with SES or the object capability perspective on JavaScript. And for people who think that JavaScript cannot be used as a secure or robust programming uh, language, I want to uh, offer this counterexample. Uh, we have a uh, function named make counter. This is using the object's closure pattern. You can do essentially the same thing with the class pattern using private state and object freeze, uh, but let's just do it, uh, let's do this one. So you have an outer function make counter, and every time you call it, it makes a new object, which is this record with an inker and decker method that uh, lexically capture this, this encapsulated count variable. So every time we call it, we make a new triple of a uh, inker function, a decker function, an encapsulated count variable and the record exposing the inker function and decker function. Uh, so that's basically the object. Uh, the harden is an abstraction over object.freeze. So the record itself cannot be um, tampered with. And every time we call it, we make a new instance where each of these instances is isolated from the other. Uh, with one of these, one of the things that you can do what can you do with one of these counters with an anchor and a decker? Uh, you can, for example, if you want to uh, count the number of things entering and exiting a container, uh, you could have an entry guard guarding the entrance to the container, an exit guard guarding the exit to the container, and give the entry card the ability to increment and give the exit card the ability to decrement. And the intuition that a programmer should take to this if they don't know the odd corners of JavaScript, what does this program seem to be doing? It seems to be giving the entry guard only the ability to, to increment and giving the exit guard only the ability to decrement. So the basic idea of SES is to uphold that expectation, to actually make it possible to only give the entry guard the ability to, to increment using the code pattern that you saw. The reason that JavaScript is a suitable language for creating this secure runtime, the secure SES runtime, and why the resulting SES system is really essentially just JavaScript as far as the experience that programmers have is because JavaScript is uniquely well set up uh, for carving out this object capability behavior, this object capability form of JavaScript from the language. Even going back to ECMAScript 3, which was the JavaScript that we had when, when I joined the committee, 
there was this accident of history where JavaScript, the language, was being standardized under ECMA. The browser was being standardized under W3C. And even though for the first decade of JavaScript's existence, the only host that mattered was the browser, this jurisdictional separation between two standards bodies prevented most browser concepts from leaking into the language definition and prevented all browser effects from leaking into the language definition. So the language itself was left as a language without IO, a language that essentially had no abilities to cause effects to the world outside of itself, but provided a means for hosts like the browser to provide that ability to cause effects by providing host objects like XML HTTP request and uh, uh, window and document and all the rest of it, uh, providing those host objects by populating the global address space. And then JavaScript objects could only get initial access to a host object by global scope lookup. So if you can intervene on the global scope lookup, you're in a position to virtualize the host essentially completely, virtualize all abilities to cause external effects. It's very much like how in a hardware architecture, when you have a clean separation between the user mode instruction set and the system mode instruction set, and all attempts to do system things cause traps, you can essentially virtualize any operating system on top of such a machine. So that gives us support for realms as a unit of isolation. JavaScript furthermore supports object granularity protection by virtue of the fact that each object, the only things it's born with implicit access to are the primordials. Like when you evaluate a open square bracket, closed square bracket, it's born inheriting from object from array.prototype. So there's all those things it has implicit access to. All of those things which we call the primor the collectively the primordials, the objects that exist before code starts running, have almost no hidden mutable state in them. Meaning that almost all of their mutable state are in exposed properties. So if you transitively freeze them, if you freeze all of those objects and therefore lock down all of their properties, there's essentially no hidden state left. So the only things that objects implicitly have access to are not a, does not give them an ability to cause any effects. And therefore, all of their abilities to cause effects on an object by object basis are based on what other objects they're explicitly given access to. So this is, I'm going to use this little sample of the primordials to just stand for the full set of primordials. So the primordials come in a self-contained graph. One of the things very nice about the primordials is they point at each other, but they don't point at anything outside the primordials. So traverse, traversing these pointers only takes you from primordial to primordial. And there's also the global object, which has these global property names, these property names that point at some of these primordials and of the primordials, uh, there's a special category of primordial that we call the evaluators for which the global object serves a special role. In this picture, function and eval are evaluators and two evaluators 
when they evaluate code for any name lookup, where it's, you're, you're looking up a variable name that's not defined within the code for any, free, that, uh, for any lookup of a free variable, it's looked up in the global scope and the global scope is essentially aliases the property names of the global object. So function and eval are evaluating code within the scope of this global object. The main thing CES is about is locking down all the primordials, freezing it, which is the, I'm indicating here with the uh, filled in uh, gray and dark colors. So all those objects are frozen and introduce a new abstraction, which is the compartment, where a compartment is a realm in the sense of an execution scope, an, uh, an execution context uh, for code to be running in. So each of these other boxes is, all, is, is a compartment, but a compartment differs from a full realm as we've known it in that it does not have its own set of primordials. It inherits the primordials from the full realm it's created in. So since these full realms are also realms, uh, we introduce terminology distinction. The full realm, we call it a root realm. And then the compartments are a, also a kind of realm, but they're a realm within a root realm. And each compartment only costs a few objects. And this ability to create featherweight uh, protection domains is in particular important to access the, uh, the embedded JavaScript uh, for devices with limited memory so we can have many featherweight compartments with very little space overhead per compartment. JavaScript exists in four primar primary hosting environments. Of course, it started in the browser. Also the single machine server, this, which we call the solo server. Embedded is also a widespread use of JavaScript, but it's not a well-known use of JavaScript. Uh, there are many devices that, that, including probably some in your house, that are actually uh, running an embedded JavaScript. And then of course, now blockchain is a new hosting environment. On the browser, Agoric and Salesforce collaborated together to create this, the uh, SES shim, which shims the proposal, but does it with real security. Uh, and this goes back to the SES that in, in an earlier generation was part of Google Kaha, uh, during the ECMAScript five days, Agoric and Salesforce have reconstructed that functionality, taking full advantage of modern JavaScript and doing an SES for modern JavaScript. And Salesforce is running a 5 million developer ecosystem on their Lightning platform for which this SES shim is the security card. We've been working with some core node people, in particular, uh, Bradley uh, Farias and um, uh, Guy Bedford to bring direct support for elements of SES uh, into Node, uh, which I'll be explaining on the next, more on the next slide. The JavaScript for embedded devices uh, there's both XS, which I mentioned, and there's the new standards group under ECMA, TC53, which is standardizing JavaScript modules for embedded devices. TC53 is explicitly using SES as the standard JavaScript for embedded devices, such that the standardization of all the modules for embedded assumes SES as the context of execution and XS, which is the main JavaScript on embedded devices uh, represented by Modable here on the committee, uh, they already have a configuration 
out of the box that's a full SES implementation. It's not a, sh it's not a uh, SES created by carving it out of a full JavaScript engine at runtime. It's rather a runtime which, which just has SES and omits the parts of JavaScript that are not in SES. And then of course, Agoric is bringing SES to the blockchain. And MetaMask is, as I mentioned, uh, has created a browserify plugin called uh, Sessify that is using Sess to do this uh, uh, safe module linkage. So our notion of what the proposals should be and what the boundaries between them are, what the relationships are, has been shifting. And that's a reason why we want to, to settle this down and complete the design more uh, before we, we take it for stage advancement, which hopefully we'll do very soon. But initially we were thinking in terms of a three layer system, realms on the bottom, then frozen realms, and then SES on top. Over time, elements of frozen realms move down into our notion of what the realms proposal should be, and elements of frozen realms moved up into what we considered SES to be, and it just, over time, it, there wasn't enough difference to justify three layers, it really collapsed into these two layers. And the realms layer was about both creating new root realms and creating new compartments within root realms. But what we realized over time, as we went to apply SES uh, to various systems, is that the use cases for creating root realms and the use cases for creating compartments were quite distinct. In particular, the embedded use with XS is an environment that is not able to create multiple root realms in which there's no reason to do the engineering to enable multiple root realms. It really is quite naturally a single root realm environment. And likewise, in the browser, a worker is a single root realm environment. There's no ability to create multiple root realms within a worker, and there's not, mu not much reason uh, to change that. So we want to separate out the compartment support so that the compartment support is able to secure the root realm that it finds itself in and to create multiple compartments within that root realm without the assumption of creating new root realms. So we want these things more separated. Node has been making uh, great progress bringing elements of CES directly into Node uh, so that Node can provide more direct support for CES and CES-like security. So Node already comes with an experimental flag. It's already shipping with this experimental uh, frozen intrinsics flag that when turned on actually creates a instantiation of Node in which in the main environment, all the, all the intrinsics, which is the primordials, are already born frozen. Uh, Bradley has been working on this uh, tofu static analyzer to extract from existing code an approximation of what authorities it initially depends on so that you can do the kind of analysis and constraint that we saw with, um, that I explained when I showed uh, Kumavis's graph. 
node really has only three globals, which is, or, or I suppose four globals, process, array, buffer, and then require and module for, but the require and module with module that exports, those are really just the common JS form of import and export. They're just the mechanism for, for importing and exporting among common JS modules. So the, the, the interesting things as global variables in Node is process and array buffer. And uh, Guy Bedford has been making uh, good progress on quarantining those so that they're not visible from ECMAScript standard modules. They're, they only remain visible from common JS modules so that we can deprecate them and hope to diminish their access over time. But whether we quarantine them that way or not, the compartment mechanism already gives us the ability to create compartments in which these are absent or virtualized. So we still have control over these, whether or not the platform gives us direct quarantining of it. There's work on a extensible control of the module loading system uh, for being able to remap and attenuate imports. And the main compatibility problem that you run into when you freeze the primordials is the override mistake. For example, if you create a new object in the context, in a context in which all the primordials are frozen and you want to give it a two string method by saying, uh, object dot to string equals new function. If the primordials are naively frozen, that assignment will fail uh, because of a spec mistake that, that uh, the ECMAScript committee uh, made many years ago that we've failed to fix. However, there is a known workaround, which is for those properties to turn them from data properties into accessor properties where the getter setter behavior emulates what the behavior would have been for a frozen data property in the absence of the override mistake. Uh, and Guy Bedford has already gotten uh, that fix to the primordials uh, in for all of the primordial prototype objects, which is where, it's, where the problem practically arises. Uh, the experience at Salesforce uh, says that even more narrowly, uh, there are five of the primordial prototypes, uh, array, object, function. I don't remember what the other two are, uh, but if you uh, do this masking of the override mistake for the methods on those five prototypes, the problem practically goes away for most code. So these URLs take you to the interesting things that represent the current state of SES. The first link is the official link to the SES proposal, which, which is still at stage one. And I recommend that you don't look at it very hard because the text of that is way stale compared to our current understanding. It has not been revised in quite a long time. What's much more relevant is the second link, uh, which is the draft standalone SES spec. And what we mean by that is that the, the SES spec primarily had focused on the API for creating an SES environment starting from a full JavaScript environment. What we realized, especially because of the embedded case, is that the thing to specify first is what would be, what is the SES environment that results from creating an SES environment, however you create it. Get that pinned down first and then worry about the API for creating it. 
And that suits Modable and Embedded perfectly well because those machines can just start out as standalone SES machines without a prior JavaScript you have created it from. When we started off defining compartments as reflected in the graphics that you, that you saw, we were mostly focused on the behavior of the runtime evaluators like eval and function. And we had not yet pinned down what the actual semantics were for safe module loading and module linkage under SES. Uh, all the existing users of SES, um, Salesforce and MetaMask in particular, also Agoric, um, uh, all three of us were using existing packagers to turn modules into evaluable scripts so we can use our support for safe script evaluation, but we need a first class semantics for safe modules for SES. And this problem became more urgent with embedded because in embedded, the normal configuration has no runtime evaluators. You do all of your evaluation at build time, creating the system that you then put into ROM that then runs code at runtime. So Modable came up with our first compartment spec that has a system for module loading and import remapping and attenuation that they have implemented in the shipping Modable SES engine and which Agoric is now working on implementing as an extension of our own SES shim. And that's a safe module system that does not assume the existence of runtime evaluators, but is consistent with the existence of runtime evaluators uh, for, for, for the more conventional environments in which those would also be on a com per compartment basis. Uh, there's the shim itself, uh, which we're using. The locker service is the uh, system that Salesforce is using that I mentioned. Sessify is the system that MetaMask is using as a uh, pl plugin for Browserify. Uh, and the full Agoric system with smart contracting all built and running on blockchain all sitting on top of Sess is at, at the Cosmos Swing Set API. And now I'll take questions. Are you all still there? Yep, I'm still here. So um, you have pared down the proposal a lot. Uh, it sounds like uh, these are meant to be run on the same agent and potentially talking with each other. You didn't mention in your presentation the ability for compartments to create other compartments within themselves. Is that still being discussed? So compartments can create other compartments because there's this compartment, um, you know, this proposed new compartment global, which would just be one of the primordials, just, you know, you know a proposed new primordial alongside, uh, you know, date and regexp and all the other language global primordials. Uh, so it would be, in, so the compartment API would be in scope to all the compartments. So the compartments can create new compartments. Uh, there's no, there was never any sense in which when compartment A creates compartment B, there was never any sense in which uh, B is within A. B is fully under the control of A because A was uh, use the compartment API to parameterize what the nature of B was, but structurally both A and B are just directly nested under the root realm that both of them are within. So there's no, there's no loss of flexibility with regard to any of those issues in the current proposal that I'm aware of. 
And Realms and SES were never cross-agent. Uh, there was never any, any discussion in either Realms or SES about multiple agents, where an agent is a unit of concurrency. Uh, it was always multi about multiple realms within one heap of objects. Sure. Uh, I mostly mentioned agents because you were talking about workers and things as realm uh, containers that are natural. Yes. Uh, I wasn't thinking about uh, uh, realms or compartments having any bearing on how workers talk to each other, but rather on the ability to create uh, multiple protection domains uh, within a worker with even though there's no ability to create multiple root realms in a worker. We don't need to do the engineering to enable multiple root realms in a worker in order to, to divide a worker up into these multiple protection domains. And that was actually raised by MetaMask. Uh, MetaMask wants to be able to run code in a worker in the browser where there's a separation of authority among the code running within one worker. Also, um, I know you've mentioned uh, that there's some remappings for modules. Has there been discussion around API designs for intercepting not only static uh, module graphs, but dynamic ones as well? Uh, the, the main discussions of that have been uh, in these SES meetings uh, with you. I mean, the, that this, this um, all of the times when we explored what those APIs for doing a, a, a code-based mapping, for having the mapping under control of code, uh, were uh, discussions with you. Uh, what we're currently targeting as a interim step is the compartment API that comes from Modable because it has the expressiveness that we initially need uh, and because they actually have it working. So it's an interesting uh, target. They have working and there's tests. So they provide as an argument when you create a compartment, uh, they provide a static uh, mapping table there. Uh, but the kind of API that you've shown us during these sessions where there's two procedural hooks uh, is much more where we want to go to. And you saw some of that reflected in, in Michael's presentation earlier about the steps we've taken towards modules where there was a uh, load uh, function in the options bag to evaluate. And uh, that probably should be more like the, the, the two argument API uh, that you showed us where there is a uh, first class unforgeable capability that represents a loaded module identity. But, but we, we haven't gotten to where uh, that's the main engineering issue yet. That's probably, I would expect that that's where we're going to end up. We would still want to be able to express simple remappings declaratively whether we do that on top of the operational mechanism or not, uh, because the output of the Tofu tool will just give us simple static rewiring that we want to be able to run in such a way where that's the source of most of the rewirings that we do. And I should mention that uh, you know, in the browser, uh, there's this W3C import map thing that has similar declarative rewiring information. Some of it's actually you know, quite well designed in terms of how they factor out common remappings. Uh, so as we proceed to define a declarative format, we should, I think, seek to not be 
gratuitously different than the existing browser import maps, but we have to do something that's suitable for our security goals.